Thank you. Um, in this business, we often like to talk about war stories. Well, this is real war stories. And this is also, I think, one of the most important stories of our time. The story of the Ukrainian people defending their independence and freedom against Russian aggression. And it is about cyber conflicts when it's a part of real war. And some of the things you've learned about defending against cyber attacks has to be thrown out the window because there is a new set of rules altogether. My name is Matthias Wollén. So I've spent most of my working life in Swedish intelligence, 30 years at Försvarets Radioanstalt. Before two years ago, I joined TrueSec as threat intelligence expert and my yeah. colleague. My name is Niklas Kaiser, also work at TrueSec. I do a little bit of everything. Malware analysis is one of the things, and ICS security as well. Um, I would say it's, it's humbling so many people here. Like, I wonder the combined amount of segment faults has been pushed by this audience here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for coming. So, like all good stories, uh, this story needs an enemy. And this is what we're going to talk a lot about. The GRU Unit 74455, known to most of us as Sandworm. That is the Russian Armed Forces Cyber Warfare Unit. Um, they have a headquarters in Chimki, a uh, suburb to Moscow. And they have been active in Ukraine since 2015. When the Ukrainians say that the war didn't start 24th February, it started in 2014. Uh, the activities of Sandworm is one of the reasons. This is just a quick list of the attacks attributed by Western intelligence to Sandworm. Black Energy, the first large-scale attack against uh, the uh, Ukrainian electricity grid was actually two waves of attacks. Not Petya, um, the most destructive um, cyber attack probably ever. French elections, Olympic destroyer uh, attack, trying to sabotage the, uh, win the uh, opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics and the attacks against the Parliament of Georgia in 2019. There's also another opponent here, an unidentified GR unit called Ember Bear. It is also likely a Russian army cyber war unit. Possibly, uh, it's probably subordinate to Sandworm. It could be um, a, a military districts, the Lower, the next level under the central command in Russia uh, organizing their own. It could possibly even be uh, tied to uh, the Belarus armed forces. And they have been active in Ukraine since at least 2021. The defenders, the underdogs in this attack is the State Service for Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine, or CERT-UA. Located in Kyiv, established in 2006, and tasked of defending Ukrainian cyberspace. The first of three major waves of attacks that we're going to discuss uh, began already on January 14th. This is before the war actually started. This is an intimidation attack. This is when the Russian army had deployed all around the borders of Ukraine. There were intense political pressure on the Ukrainians 
and Russia basically demanded submission. And they were probably going to invade regardless what the Ukrainians did, from what we understand. But the task here was to scare Ukrainians to basically give up without a fight. Uh, the same day this attack we're going to describe happened, uh, Russians arrested 13 members of the R. Evil ransomware gang. First of all, it's important to know that at that time, R. Evil was basically defunct. They, they had stopped their operations. They were, they were gone. But the fact that they were arrested on the same day was obviously part of the same Russian diplomacy. Hey, you have a choice now in the West. You can look the other way and we will help you. We will arrest all those pesky ransomware gangs you've been complaining about. Or we'll let those sandworm. Look more specifically at the January 14th cyber attack. This time it was Ember Bear, the smaller unit. Uh, they were targeting government and banks. They used one wiper, a tool called Whispergate, but they also amplified this attack with DDoS attacks, web defacements, things that really doesn't constitute a serious breach, but it gets attention, it gets news. It tells people that, ooh, it's scary, our system it works actually better than the real destruction. Um, and the objective, as I said, intimidation. Send the message that we own your networks, resistance is futile. So, yeah, looking at the sort of technical part, running the wipers. Actually, I had a movie here, but uh, with some technical issues. So there's just, you have to trust me, when we run it, it's going to look like this uh, on reboot. Uh, so you have this kind of fake ransomware note once the computer starts. And it's a fake ransomware note. It's not real. Uh, this is from the wiper. And we're going to do like a little bit of a technical deep dive into this one. Uh, to touch base. Uh, this is sort of the general feeling from it. Um, what's interesting, they use uh, the compiler, MinGV, which it's, I, haven't see, I don't see that much, but sort of looking at, at the wiper, this is the, the main program. Uh, and it actually is a quite crappy wiper. But uh, what I want to show with this picture is like, this is more or less the whole program. And this is what it takes to make, because it's actually a cyber weapon. When you're looking at it you know, from, a, from a sort of a computer analyst point, you just see the, the bits and bytes. But if you back out, it's actually, this is a weapon that has been used for destructive measures. And that's, then you kind of understand the seriousness about it. But if we jump a little bit into the, to the, the Viper itself, but what does it do? First, it uses uh, the API called create file. I have a point. I actually have two, two screens. Let's see if I can do this, because I can't point at the... If I point here, you don't see, do you? So, uh, it use create file. Let's see over there as well. Uh, there. And what create file, it doesn't sort of... It also opens a file. But what it does, it opens the, the raw access to the disk. And sort of what it sort of what wants to write is hidden within uh, one of the resources. And that, that's the top resource. And you can see the resource, what's sort of written down here. And that's the fake ransomware note that's, sort of, that's going to be written into the master boot records. I will show it later on. But that's, sort of, that's baked within, within the binary resource there. And sort of once it runs, it writes straight to the disk at the MBR, starting at zero. So to the, let's see now, to the left, this is sort of a normal functioning MBR. To the left, let's see, is it to the left or to the right? <laughs> to the one, I don't know, what left to right, yeah. 
that pointing that direction. Uh, that, that, that's the normal functioning one. And this one, this is a corrupt one after the wiper is run. And you might notice, you see here, your hard drive has been encrypted. Uh, do, the people, do the people over there see when I point there, or should I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there you see this fake, fake ransomware note that, that's ex sort of shown to, to the user. And sort of, when I was digging into this, I actually sort of had to, okay, how does the master boot record work? And I was sort of, how to give an interesting lecture, I thought, let's, you know, share a little bit of what I learned from the master boot record. And they probably, you know, sort of deep dive uh, reversers here that this is like, it is for breakfast. But for the rest of us, I thought this was a sort of good, what, what we're looking at. And as you remember, might have noticed on the first, this is sort of the, the things how it looks like. And the top one is the master boot routine. And that consists of the master boot code and the error message. And if you remember, the error message, that was the fake ransomware note. But in a, in a proper one, it says uh, uh, portion uh, loading operation system missing. Sort of, that's where they wrote their fake ransomware note. After that, you have the portion table, and then you have the master boot signature 55AA in the bottom down there. So that's sort of, a, if you see that, that's a master boot record signature. Uh, I do quite a lot of malware analysis, and I am a big fan of Cyberchef. And you can actually load these kind of these this opcodes into Cyberchef, and, you can, and they have this super nice uh, function called disassemble 886, and it turns these opcodes into assembly. So this is actually the master boot record program. Sort of, I think it's a nice feature. Just a little tip. And if you look on the sort of this, the, the portion table, that, that stuff that sort of it writes over, it, it sort of, that's the signature 80 here. Uh, that indicates this is a bootable sector. And then it goes down here to the zeros here that says it's not a bootable sector. And uh, part of this big string, you have the, the uh, portion type, and then you have the starting sector. But this is sort of, that's the whole thing this wiper does. It overwrites everything. That's why it becomes corrupt. Uh, but you can actually pull this into 010, the, the, the hex editor, which is a super duper. If you're going to buy one program, that's the one you should buy. And I have no sponsorship. I just like their stuff. And it actually parses the whole master boot record things out for you for free. So just a little tip. Uh, what it did, sort of, we are focusing on the wipers, but they also had some other nasty stuff uh, when they did this. Sort of, one of the things, a wiper, they also did sort of, because that destroys the, the computers, but they also did ransomware, and they did this in a sort of two-stage thingy. And this is the stage number two, uh, which had this something.exe, I don't read Russian, uh, file, that sort of was a fake file, and uh, it was a .NET file. Uh, maybe a little bit too small, but it had this kind of down xx, low xx. Mm, I think you want to download something. And it downloaded a picture from a, well, claimed to be a picture from a Discord channel. But that picture was uh, actually not a picture. It was, an e well, it was a file, let's say like that. It was a file. The stage three looked like this. And does anything, anyone see here what it is? It says like, it starts here like cooler and something, 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 said M in the bottom. So it's a, it's a MC file backwards that which it pulled down. They're kind of, they try to hide their EXE in, in sort of <laughs> turning everything around. So it's an EXE, so it's a relocation. And, uh, so this is, and this is the malware, they, also not malware, the ransomware they spread after, after the master boot records do like this kind of double destruction. Back to Matthias. Yeah. So, how did Ukraine respond to this first attack? Well, one thing that we will come back to over and over again is that Ukraine has been under attack for eight years by a very highly qualified state-sponsored actors. And they've realized that when you, given the state of technology today, and given the capacity of threat actors like uh, the Russians, like Sandworm, uh, total protection is not possible. 
you also need a strong response. You have to have people that can quickly go in and restore what's been damaged. I can't just count on always being able to stopping it. So that's one of the things they're doing. But the rest of their response, because this was, there was a, not a military attack, there was a political attack, is to get a political response. Identify the attacker, make sure that everybody knows this was not ransomware. This was a state-sponsored threat act. It was the Russians going after them. And it's also reaching out to allies to try to build, uh, find uh, others. There's a lot of both private and state actors from the rest of the world who's trying to uh, want to support Ukraine. And they start to build uh, so that something more than just your own capacity for the real storm that is coming. And the real storm that came, the strategic coup, if you wish, was February 23rd, hours before the invasion on the 24th. Russia had planned as we know now, a lightning invasion, a kind of Russian version of shock and awe when they would just go hell for leather from all directions, paralyze Ukraine and decapitate the leadership and just take over before the Ukrainians really managed to organize a proper defense. The cyber attack this time was the threat actor Sandworm. Their target were government and communications. Tools, hermetic wiper and acid rain, two wipers. One aimed at government communication sites like, or, or like TV and so on. The other, acid rain, aimed at knocking out uh, the um, satellite routers used by the U Ukraine, both the Ukrainian army and the government for emergency communications. The aim to paralyze when the tanks, Russian tanks, roll over the border, the Ukrainian leadership would not even be able to give issue commands to their forces what to do and hope that that confusion would add to the fear, the overwhelming might of Russia, so the Ukrainians would just lay down their arms. Cut the head of the opponent. So, yeah, now they bring out the, the, big, the big guns. Uh, this is sort of me trying to run the Viper with a movie that's not functional, so it looks like this. Uh, once rebooted. Actually, this one reboots itself. And um, if you start looking at this, this uh, um, Viper, it was actually digitally signed by, uh, with a certificate from the, this company called Hermetic uh, something, uh, Digital Limited. And that's a company in Cyprus that there's they a computer gaming company. But he's, uh, this was an interesting article uh, that sort of he is actually, uh, he writes scripts for computer games. So he's not like, not a programmer, he's a script writer. And he had no idea that they had registered this certificate in his company's name. And uh, this was actually registered in April the year before. So this was like, that sort of indicates that. Uh, this was gone, this, like a cyber weapon they had on the shelves uh, for, you know, for a rainy day. And if you start looking at this, this the Hermetic Viper, uh, it has some interesting features. If you look at the resources. It ha yeah, this, the, sort of the, the symbol was this kind of gift wrap package. But also within it, they had this sort of four drivers. 
And uh, those drivers were sort of utilized, but sort of what kind of stuff was that drivers? And they were also digitally signed by this the Chinese company, Chengdu UV Tech uh, Development. And if you took out those drivers and then if you run them in virus total, uh, you get seven hits, but sort of from mo all minor, minor sort of AV engines. Like how come sort of this sort of this discrepancy? It turns out actually that this driver is uh, this EOSUS uh, Partial Master driver utility. So it is a valid program that's very popular in China. Uh, but the, they had baked this thingy within this wiper that they're going to utilize later on. So by itself, it's not malicious. But sort of it's, it's good for, for, for threat hunting, for instance. Sort of we threat hunted for these drivers for, in our customers. Like if you have it, you know, it might be affected, but maybe not. But sort of it gives an indication. But yeah, it, by itself, it's actually a completely legit program. Uh, yeah, but this wiper... It wanted to really destroy everything. So one of the feature it disabled the, the volume shadow copy. So uh, oh, sorry, it disabled the crash dump. So just to sort of try to remove any sort of uh, assistance in, in restoring stuff forensically. Because uh, yeah, if, if it crashes, stuff can end up in the in the in the in the crash dump, and then data might be saved there. Uh, it also did a thingy, this was also a movie, that's what, it's not functional, but uh, the malware bytes did an interesting discovery. Before the wiper starts, it did a lot of, lot of I.O. operations. And what it does is sort of it's defragment the disk, sort of, so it spreads out the data. So before the, the wiper is, is running, it sort of spreads out the data, which makes it harder to, to restore stuff as well. So it takes every measure it can to just make it hard to restore any data it's going to wipe. Uh, later on, it's also dis disabled the volume shadow copy. So, uh, if, if there will be any sort of uh, that will be there, try to remove that as well. So, as I said, aiming for, for a complete destruction of, of, this, uh, of the computer. Uh, and then it actually saves this driver after that, uh, after this, this disable all these checks. It saves this driver uh, the, from EOSUS to the disk and it creates this service uh, called SS. And, uh, and then before that, it has two, two random letters. And in this case, it's called tt.dr. But every time you run it, it's called something else dr.sys. And before it wipes, it actually uses the, the crypt API just to generate noise. Uh, and then it uses this disk drive utility to write to the disk with this random noise data just to destroy it. And it goes both for the master boot record, but it also goes for the MFT as well. So really aims for destruction. So to the left, it's a normal MFT. And to the right, it's sort of after the wiper is run. And it's just, just noise near. It's just scramble, aiming for yeah, trying to destroy all data possible in there. It also had another feature within it. It's not in this presentation. It has, uh, it could have actually spread also over the another program, but the same with the same digital signature. So it could spread over SMB and VMI as well. So within the environment, sort of push this uh, wiper over the network as well, aiming for, as I said, complete destruction. And then. Parallel to this, uh, it also, they released this Acid Rain. It was also a wiper, but targeting more and more uh, modems and... and uh, satellites. Sat wow. Satellites, yeah. So, sort of, this is, as we speak, like, just before the 24th, try to disable as much, destabilizing as much as po possible before the forces are moving in. So, this well-planned, well-executed uh, wiper that aimed at basically make it impossible for the Ukrainian leadership to even give orders to their troops. Uh, how did they respond? What did they do? Well, I think all of us in here who have had any type of interest in what's happening in Ukraine, it's probably seen a version of the clip there. 
you see Vladimir Zelensky, the president of the Ukraine, with some of his closest advisors, taking a selfie for Instagram, telling people of Ukraine, we are here, we are fighting, please fight with us. And you know, it's a great piece of social media history. And you know, one of those awesome rah-rah moments on YouTube. But it's also a way for a very media savvy president to reach out to his people where normal communications are wrecked by this Russian cyber attack. They're using social media, whatever they can get handle. There is reports of Ukrainian force commanders knocking doors on civilian homes, begging to borrow their uh, civilian iPhone so they can try and get FaceTime with high command because their satellite communication is wiped and done. So they, but because of social media, phones, what apps, whatever they can get hold of, they manage to establish communications and give orders anyway, even though what is carefully planned to be used is wrecked by this Russian cyber attack. This is also in a very early, where most of us, me included, thought it was a question of days before the Russians had overrun Kyiv and forced the government to flee or be captured. You know, we, we, in a modern world, you know, we might talk, well, is a country still a country if it's occupied? You can also say, is a country a country? Is a government a, still a government if all its data is captured? Um, suddenly it became a race to save the data of the government of Ukraine. All their ministries, their population registries, whatever it is, and all the data that together makes part of the Ukrainian government. And up until that moment, they had followed the old rules, the rules for cybersecurity. How do you protect important national security data. Well, first of all, never store it outside the borders. Make sure that you keep it in, in, in a safe uh, place and you don't, you don't use you know, the cloud, things like that, because that's bad, because you can't control who, who has control over your data. So you bring it into a safe server somewhere in the capital where it has both physical and digital security. Excellent. Well, except one cruise missile could hit that server hall and it'd be gone. What do we do? Get shit into the cloud as fast as possible. Because saving that data is more important than worrying whether, well, you know, if it's in the cloud, technically the Microsoft and then maybe FBI, that could be bad. You know, we don't have time for that. We have a Russian army that might march down the streets of Kiev tomorrow. And um, it's another story, it's not my story to tell, but there was actually an international effort with both government and private people where Trusek paid a tiny little part at the end of it. Uh, assisting the Ukrainian government to save their data out of the country. Because that was suddenly, you know, the way to have some continuity to save there was now to get it outside the country. Move it to the cloud now. Very different from what national security is in peacetime. So I hope you, like me, look at that image in a slightly different way now. It's still an awesomely cool media savvy president who 
was probably born for this moment, but it's also like a des desperate measure when everything else was probably down from this cyber attack. But, as we know, Ukraine persisted. Uh, Russia got bogged down militarily and eventually had to retreat from Kyiv and realize that their plan to just overwhelm Ukraine almost without a fight had gone badly wrong. And now they were in for total war. A war where it was no longer enough to try and pick off the leadership or knock out the communist challenge. They were started the, me the, the methodo methodical work of actually trying to destroy Ukraine, destroy its infrastructure, destroy the very idea that there is such a place as Ukraine. And they used massed artillery, and they also used new cyber weapons. The April 8th cyber attack was the first of these. The threat actor was again GRU Unit 74455 Sandworm, and the target was the energy grid to try and force Ukraine into submission by simply destroying the energy grid. And really, you know, if, if, if they succeed, probably be worse for the civilians than for their military. The military, they, they, they train for operate without off-grid. People not. The tools were caddy wiper, a new wiper, and in destroyer too. Uh, malware specifically to destroy uh, industrial control systems used in the energy grid. And this time, the objective is destruction. So, yeah, uh, the Caddy Viper was actually run first at some governance, and then later on it reappeared attacking the electrical grid. And uh, this is sort of how it looks like when First, it blue screens, and then it boots uh, after you run the wiper. And it looks like this. And if you go deep dive into this one, uh, it has very few functional calls to start with. But because that's why they use, they use this thing called stack strings, which is they kind of store uh, data in, in, in bytes, so then they can resolve it upon running it. And this is a kind of, let's say, an obfuscation, it's not hard to deobfuscate, but it's sort of... Uh, I would say they probably did it in a haste. Uh, this is a way just to, you know, maybe get around AV. But yeah, if you deobfuscate it, uh, there's a excellent, two excellent tools by the, the people of Mandiant. Uh, one called Floss, uh, one called uh, uh, Kappa. And then you can actually uh, unravel them quite quickly. And that's sort of what's, what I've done here. And see what, and then start mapping different functional calls to different functions within there. So, uh, but just yes, just to see, like, yeah, they're trying to hide. One interesting call they did is this one. It's, uh, and what it checks is if it's on a, pr a primary domain controller, it terminates, which indicates they probably leveraged. Uh, uh, a domain controller for the attack. Uh, so if they would run the Viper on their own computer, they don't want to destroy themselves, so to speak. That's the guess. But they're kind of using this kind of pushing it with, with uh, group policies, pushing these, these Vipers out uh, from the domain controller, like using the same tools, ways that ransomware actors do. But uh, yes, sort of a, probably a self-check not to sort of so off your own branch, is that the thing in English, or is it just, it's a swinglish, yeah, maybe, someone knows, yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe works. Uh, and then what it does is sort of it's, uh, after it's done this, it, it prefers for, for, for data destruction. 
And what it does, it loops, loops through all the partitions. So it starts at C and goes to Z, but it also goes to Z plus one. That's down there, or let's see, I think, I don't see, I think it's there. Uh, so it's Z plus one, which sort of, I think this is a program mistake. I'm not sure, but it's sort of uh, also another indication that this was sort of, they went from, from the, this kind of, yeah, we're going to take Ukraine within a couple of days. Let's bring the big guns, the hermetic wiper. They're like, oh, holy crap. This is a war. We don't have any more cyber weapons. Let's create something quickly. And, and then sort of that's why we see probably programming errors and this kind of obfuscation th things, because th this was not prepared, not playing around. Uh, uh, and what it does, this to wipe this one, they actually use this uh, IO control disk set drive layout functionality, which is sort of it's a uh, portion manager. But it's, this one also sort of wipes instead of you know portioning it, sort of gives you just you know trash. And back to Matthias. Yeah. So the Ukrainian response to this, uh, as I said before, the Ukrainians have long experience with dealing with Russian cyber war. And again, as I said before, one of the things they learn is it's just not enough to do your best to protect your system. You're going to get breached eventually anyway, especially when you have some really qualified data actors after you. So a lot of the job is trying to increase resilience minimize the impact of the breach that's bound to happen. One thing they did it is that they have segmented their networks. They don't have their whole electric grid in one network. They have several smaller networks so that if one gets uh, breached, they can only do local damage. By this time, they had managed with help from uh, allies uh, to get better detection capabilities. And they were quite very quickly discovered when the Russians started to move in the system. And again, rapid response, not just have a detection, but having people ready to go, bam, within minutes of them receiving the warning, the Ukrainians' rapid response were in the network, isolating, stopping, and trying to kick out. And the result of this effort on their part meant that this attack actually didn't do all that much damage. There were localized power outs in the few hours and that's it. Then the enemy was kicked out, and then they quickly restored from backups and were up and running again. And I think that is, that is all, uh, one of the many lessons of this cyber war, that protection is good, but for resilience, be able to resist this type of cyber war, you also need detection, and response, to be able to go in quickly, kick them out, because they're going to get in. We all know who sit here know enough how much the technology today is stacked in the attacker's favor. Yeah, so they actually, they use this uh, in, uh, uh, combination with the end destroyer too, which was targeting targeting uh, the energy grid. And there's, yeah, there's I don't have that insight, but what I've, what, for what I know, they actually succeeded to run the end destroyer uh, and take yeah, limited power outage. But Ukrainians are very resilient. I mean, that's I think that's a big lessons learned that they restore very quickly. And so yeah, that's a, that's a great, good write-up from, from the Ukrainian search, which I, I admire. They do a fantastic job. If someone is here, you know, my applause to you, hats off. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the, all the great stuff you do. 
And I also want to do a shout out to Eric, who's here. I mean, it's one of the most clever guys I know. Uh, he, he did an excellent write up on End Destroyer 2. And you can also download a PCAP from the End Destroyer 2 crappiness. Uh, so if, you, if you're like me or like Eric, who loves Wireshark and T Shark and you know, all, that, all that goodness in the PCAP, you, know, you can download that and, and learn from to you know, protect ourselves. And then, like, sorry for a shameless plug, I, I actually wrote a, a blog about the, 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 the Caddy Viper. It's on, a, on the TrueSec homepage. Th there's a reason why I'm doing this. It's, sort of, it's not just to promote myself. Uh, there's a, a Yara rule I, I put in there. Uh, and one of the things I like to do when, as, a, as a malware analyst is try to use the bad guy's stuff against themselves. So in this case, they actually they used stacked strings to access the raw hard drive disk, which is like, uh, if you're a legit program, that doesn't make sense. Why are you hiding that API call to the raw disk? So if you, sort of, uh, if you put these sort of this opcodes into Cyberchef, you can see that it's accessing the raw disk. And if we put this into a Yara rule, it looks like this, uh, looks like a lot of, lot of opcodes, but this is sort of this is accessing raw disk uh, with stack strings. And uh, yeah, I know this actually has been run on some, some, some governments actually, so for, for protection, but sort of, yeah, use, they're trying to hide, but by, by hiding, you know, they become more visible. So hunt for that kind of behavior because that's sort of uh, a big way of finding, let's say threat hunting and finding what the bad stuff they're doing, sort of. So, now we've gone through the wipers. Just to finalize and go a little bit beyond the original, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the Russian hacktivism that's been directed both at Ukraine and uh, other countries, like uh, neighboring countries and so on. Uh, and the title Money and Mother Russia means that, as you will did know, um, this is uh, as much for money and fame as for patriotism, really. We picked just one of them. There are so many, but picked one on random. The August 17th DDoS attack against Estonia, um, partly because Estonia has been one of the first recipients of big DDoS attack back in order in 2007. <coughs> so they have proper defenses and didn't really happen. <coughs> Excuse me. The threat actor was one of the largest uh, Russian hacktivist gangs called Killnet. Cool. Targeting Estonian government websites, some banks and some other things. The tools Killnet uses is the, uh, their own version of the Mirai botnet. It's an IoT botnet uh, capable of producing L4, L7 DDoS. Not much to say there except the fact that um, modern DDoS protection is not DDoS protection unless you also have L7 defenses because every serious attack these days do. L7, i.e. HTTP based. So just, just protection from sin flooding is not enough anymore. Objective, I would say internet fame and donations. This is Killnet's Telegram channel where they solicit donations from their fans in Bitcoin's Monero. So who are Killnet? They actually started out as a criminal DDoS botnet. In January, the month before the war started, they launched uh, a darknet page offering their services to sell DDoS attacks, or you could rent their botnet for DDoS attacks and pay money for them. But after the war began, they switched and became hacktivists. They realized that there was a pretty good gig here. What you do is you 
Start DDoSing someone and says, ooh, we are the cyber spetsnaz of Russia. See, there, and then you screenshot that, you know, Lockheed Martin's homepage is down. See, we hacked Lockheed Martin. Hey, they make the F-35 fighter. Look how awesome we are. And it works. It works because the media buys it. How many times have we read that the media says, ooh, cyber attack, this and then, and it's a DDoS attack, and yeah, I mean, annoying. Homepage is down for half an hour, and then it's up again. Nothing's damaged behind that. But they managed to recruit around 140 people who are volunteers working for them, using there, you can see the... the um, and you even have a, 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 a smartphone app you can use for controlling DDoS attacks. Divide them into squads, use kind of semi-military language to sound even cooler. Um, their leader has, the initial founder and leader has been um, de talked by now. That's the dude over there in the corner. Looks very much like a Spetsnaz. Uh, they're cyber criminals turned patriots. Well, yeah, maybe. See, I haven't, I haven't quite made up my mind now whether this is actually should fall under hacktivism or cyber fraud. <laughs> because obviously they're using, they're doing these attacks and they know, they have to be smart enough to know that they're not really doing anything. They just garnish fame by doing pretty pointless attack. Not, not even trying, I mean, if a, sta if a real state-sponsored actor was being smart about using DDoS as a weapon to try and cripple services, they could probably do a lot of damage. But these guys, they don't, they, they don't care. They just want the screenshot, hey, it's down, we hacked them, rah, rah, us, donate money. And we know that they have gotten tens of thousands of dollars in donations from fans. So this is crowd-funded hacktivism. And as I said, you know, you could probably look at it as a form of cyber fraud too, because these people probably think that they give money for a worthy cause. So, some final conclusions. Up at the top there, we have the timeline. First, Russia prepare for the invasion, execute the invasion. They're forced to retreat and forced into a war they were not prepared for. We have a number of cyber attacks. Whispergate, during the pre preparation phase, trying to undermine Ukraine's morale. We have the day of the invasion where cyber attacks are timed to coincide with a battle plan that's been agreed in advance, planned in detail, except doesn't quite work because the Ukrainians are simply too resilient and too resourceful. And then you have a third when the war on the ground has failed, they have to rethink and plan B, plan B fast. And that's the same thing that happens in the cyber war. You have the caddy wiper, a much less smartly prepared cyber weapon than the hermetic wiper. And as background now, you have the hacktivist. And that is important because that, that is another reason probably obvious to most people who knows about hacking, but perhaps not always obvious in the political sense that a cyber weapon is not a cannon. You can't fire a gun, boom, boom, boom. A cyber weapon is a rocket. You build a rocket, you fire it, and you hope it does damage. But then everybody immediately start building signatures, detection, and so on. And if you use the same weapon again, 
it will be much less effective. You have to build a new rocket. And that second rocket was built in with much greater haste, and it wasn't as qualified, and the Ukrainians managed to stop it much more efficiently than the first one. That is the end, except um, I would personally like to dedicate this um, presentation to the brave defenders of Ukrainian cyberspace and their leader, our friend, Viktor Jora. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matthias and Nicholas. Um, what I was thinking, I mean, first of all, they're clearly they are doing a good job fending off these attacks then, so. Uh, is your primary source for the binaries and stuff, is that from CERT UA, or is there better sources for people uh, it, who want to dig through this? It's a combo, but yeah, now they all, all three wipers are available at uh, Malware Bazaar. So, I, I can, if anyone is interested, you know, I can, I can point them in that direction. All right, and for other information, I mean, is, is this a primary source of information also, the CERT UA, for when stuff happened and what was the response uh, and how long it took? Or do you have friends there we have, telling we, you? Well, it's, it's a combo. I mean, it's a combo. We have friends it there is, as well. Some of it is open source. Uh, some of it is, yeah, we had uh, CERT UA, uh, Victor Jora visiting uh, uh, Sweden and talking to Chusek. Uh, so we had a little bit of inside information there. But again, Victor Jora has all, since then also given uh, interviews openly, so it's a lot of different information bringing together. Now it looks like you're okay. Are you getting your fingers dirty helping out as well? Uh, no yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Interesting. Um, okay, we have some uh, intelligent and some non-intelligent questions from the <laughs> audience. Um, so, so I'm going <laughs> to uh, going to start with an intelligent uh, question, which is. Do you think it actually had an impact, and would it have changed if the satellites weren't attacked? Did actually all this cyber warfare, did it actually impact the war in general? Um, I would say yes, it did. I think uh, it established the fact that cyber is now a part of modern warfare. Now, you can't say cyber warfare. Some people would say, you know, cyber warfare is everything. You know, you don't even have to send the, tank, the tanks anymore. You just press a button and turn everything off and boo, you win. That's not true. That's not happening. But you can't either say it doesn't impact anything. Like, um, Ukraine managed to overcome the Russian attacks just like they managed to overcome. I mean, Russia managed to stop the tank rush to Kyiv. We can't say that the Russian tanks moving over the border didn't have an impact on the war. Of course it did. Just because it didn't ultimately succeed, of course it had an impact. Okay, th that makes sense. Uh, the next question, wh which is really relevant, you talk about all these APTs, but, but what about the deliver mechanisms? How, how does that work in, these case, in, in this case? What was the normal delivery of all these APTs? Um, I would say that from my perspective, as Nicholas already mentioned, a lot of it is they had pre-planned, of course. They had access. Uh, we don't know exactly what access, but it's the standard ones. Uh, either you, you manage to steal credentials or you find a vulnerability and you, you have a backdoor in. Uh, and then it is standard uh, ransomware 101. Privilege escalation, take over the Active Directory, uh, use group policies, and boom, you're out. Okay, another uh, good question, actually, which is, who comes up with these really cool names uh, for all these APT groups and, and the malware exploits? And what happens if the APT group is not happy if they're like Cuddly Bear, for example? So can they apply <laughs> for a new name? Or how does that work? Who's in charge uh, of basically, this? Basically, 
the major, mostly American, um, um, threat intelligence companies, CrowdStrike, FireEye, and so on, they all have their own uh, naming convention. One of them, for example, is the animals. Uh, bear means Russian, panda means Chinese, kitten means Iranian, and so on. Spider but doesn't the Iranian prime. get upset when they're kittens compared to like <laughs> yeah, bears? I, it's true. So you can say, yeah, fancy bear, yeah, that's Russian. Uh, and others use the APT 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and up. Uh, Microsoft uses um, the... Um, like metal, is metal. metal. No, the, the, the uh, elements, like elements. oxygen, nitrogen, helium, blah, 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 etc. And they all use their own, and nobody, everybody agrees that it's stupid where they have five different names for the same thing, but nobody wants to uh, give up their own system. But I would say also, like for the for the malware, uh, I would say like okay, I'm a blue, I'm a blue team. I'm super duper blue. Uh, uh, I would like them to give them a ridiculous name because you know these are assholes. So we shouldn't embrace them. I mean, we should just ridicule them because they are they're bad people doing bad stuff. So that's that, that's my opinion, anyway. So. They just rename the retarded code one. Yeah, retarded yeah. Crap, code crap, two. crap, crap, crap. one, crap, wiper two, crap, wiper three. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's the truth. The convention. Yeah. <laughs> I get retarded code. <laughs> but yeah, the, so just to hear, the GRU unit 74455, that is what the Russians call their own cyber warfare unit. So but we don't know the size of the it's unit. The main Center for Special Technology or some non descriptive thing. But we don't, don't know the size of that unit. Uh, well, not that I can say, but I would I would suspect I don't know there that. are in I, I would guess that there are, well, somewhere between 100 and 400 maybe. Okay, Good thank you very much. It. Do we have any more uh, questions from the audience? Let me come with the mic. So let's say I'm a threat actor, and I really want to obfuscate my code. Uh, how good is obfuscation in 2022? <laughs> like, is, can you always beat the obfuscation? Uh, uh, eventually, yes. I mean, it's usually a matter of time. I mean, there's so many ways of obfuscation. I mean, it's at runtime, you, you, you populate it, you use different kind of packers or compression, or, you know, there's loads and loads of way. So, uh, yes, you can, but I mean, Usually the blue team wins in the end, <laughs> I would say. Also, like I was, a little shout out. We have like a war room down there, and some of the stuff we talked about might be valuable there for the tech geeks to you know, just have a look there. I just, just saying, sorry for the pitch. Hi, uh, regarding this hermetic wiper, right? You told uh, it is using defragment and uh, also using MBR. It is infecting it, right? Uh, MBR and uh, Diffract command yeah. on Hermetic Wiper, right? Yes. Uh, but don't you think that is for old hard drive, not for the SSD or GPT partition, right? GPT partition, yeah. it is protective MBR. Do you think some motive is there to use Hermetic Wiper for the old hard drive, not new hard drive? Might, might be, because it had actually, it has even a, like an XP driver that it utilized. So it had this kind of checks. Uh, what operating system are on like before they use the driver all the way back to 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 XP computers so so that there was some indication that yeah I hope that, did I answer the question correctly or yeah okay cool okay uh, then uh, thank you very much and uh, yeah. we are uh, ready for lunch thank yeah thank you uh, and lunch is being served wait wait wait, wait, wait.